Hello and welcome to today's virtual book chat. My name is Taylor Worsham and I'm the marketing and adult programming coordinator here for Gunnison Libraries. This session is to kick off our 2022 season of Tales and Trails, the free library hiking book club. Our first book of the season is Edge of the Map by Joanna Garten and she's here with us today. She's going to intro the book and do a little bit of a presentation, and then you will have the month of May to read the book, and we'll regroup and meet on Monday, May 23rd at 6 p.m. to have a conversation with her again. And then our first hike of the season will be June 9th. All right, so I'm gonna intro Joanna now and then she'll get rolling. So Joanna is a mother, a proud Wisconsin girl, a writer and a cross country coach. In writing Edge of the Map, she interviewed more than 75 friends and family of Christine Boscoff and Charlie Fowler, the subjects of the book. Uh, she, con she conducted several weeks of research and interviews near the site of Boscoff's death in China. Not a mountaineer herself, Garten was drawn to Boscoff's story for deeply personal reasons. Hailing from the same small Midwestern hometown and in fact attending high school together, though they never met, their paths seemed destined to intersect. When Boscoff went missing in 2006, Garten's mother, also a journalist, began a 10 year deep dive into Boscoff's story as well as a close friendship with Boscoff's mother. She devoted herself to this project until a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease made it clear that Garten was meant to pick up where she left off and ensure Boscoff's story was told. Before the publication of her book, Joanna dabbled in nonprofit consulting, college teaching, and a brief but quickly extinguished career as a lawyer. She moved her family to China, been charged by an elephant, has completed over 20 marathons, she and her husband share their home in Denver with two bright children who are much wiser than she is and the inspiration for her storytelling. Welcome. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me, Taylor. I'm super excited to be part of your series. And I think this will be a great book to kick off the summer season. I'm very excited to have a chance to talk to you today and kind of intro, intro the book. Um, as Taylor mentioned, I've got some slides, about 20 minutes of slides to sort of give you a taste of edge of the map and introduce you to some of the characters in the book. So we will do that. Let's see if I can find my presentation. There we go. How does that look, Taylor? Am I good? Good. Okay, great. Good. So um, let's see, this is the book cover of Edge of the Map. Um, it is my second book. My first book was called Awakening East. Um, and as Taylor mentioned, I'm a writer, I'm based in Denver. Uh, my first book, Awakening East was published in 2015 and it was about the adoption of my two children from China and our subsequent move to China when they were about four and nine years old. And we lived in China for a very wacky year, which was the subject of the first book. So I have been an author and a writer now for many years. Prior to writing Awakening East, as Taylor mentioned, I had a number of different careers. I am trained as a journalist and a lawyer. I've worked in nonprofits for a bunch of years. I taught here in Denver at Regis University in the Master of Nonprofit Management program for about 10 years. And now I am writing. This is a picture of Mount Everest that was taken in May of, I believe it was 2019. Uh, and it's a picture a lot of you may be familiar with. It was taken by Nims Persia, who is a Nepalese mountaineer. And it was taken as he was attempting to summit Mount Everest. And it just shows this kind of catastrophic queue of climbers on the way to the summit. And I included here to illustrate where my journey with Edge of the Map started. And it was because like so many of you, I have always been fascinated by mountain stories. 
Um, so as Taylor mentioned, I'm not a climber nor a mountaineer, but for my entire life, I have been drawn to stories that take place in the mountains. I've just really wanted to understand the mentality of climbers, the risks, the drama, the losses, the grief, and all of those really exhilarating highs. So after the publication of um, Edge of, or of Awakening East, I began looking for a second project. And Taylor's told you a little bit about how this second book fell in my lap. I had a couple of projects in mind. Um, one was a deep dive into China's one child policy. One was kind of a fluffy piece of, I guess what you would call chiclet. And then there was the story of Christine Boscoff. And this was a story that my mother, who is also a writer, had been working on for about 10 years. And at the 10 year mark of working on the book, she realized she was going to have to pull back because she had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And so as she realized she wasn't going to be able to finish the book, she and I began talking and she decided to turn the book over to me. And I will tell you a little bit about more about that journey in a bit. Um, but let me tell you, I brought all of these projects, these three ideas to my writing group uh, here in Denver. And I sort of described all three and they loved the story of Christine Boscoff. It was clear that that was the book that I was meant to write. So off I went, kind of not having any idea how deep I would dive into Christine Boscoff's life. Her story was very compelling and I'd heard bits and pieces of it over the years uh, through my mother and her work on the book. Chris was the only American woman to have summited six of the world's 8,000 meter peaks. That was a record she set in the year 2000. And it actually is a record that still stands today, 22 years later, which is quite amazing. She had gone from a successful career as an aerospace engineer into the sport of mountaineering in her mid twenties. She and her husband, Keith, uh, who was, I think he was about 15 or 16 years older than her. They had bought Seattle adventure travel company, Mountain Madness from the estate of Scott Fisher. Uh, and he was a mountain guide who died on Everest in 1996. And a lot of us remember Scott and that particular tragedy through the lens of John Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air, which I'm assuming many of you have read it. It's a fabulous book. And if you haven't read it, it's actually a great sort of precursor to Edge of the Map, which I call kind of a sequel to Into Thin Air. So here we've got a picture of Chris. She, again, had this absolutely breathtaking rise in the sport of mountaineering. And given that she was a woman, her accomplishments were even more notable uh, because it's a sport that really was and continues to be dominated by men. But Chris never saw her gender as what defined her. And to me, that was what really made her story so, so captivating and so inspiring. It was kind of how she approached this passion with such great humility that made this a story that I felt, and my mother as well, felt, um, we both felt it needed to be told. So there are many twists and turns in the narrative. Uh, it is a real nail biter at points, but what is not a spoiler is that in 2006, Chris died in an avalanche in Western Sichuan province in China with her climbing partner, and her boyfriend, Charlie Fowler, who was a legendary rock climber from Telluride. So right in your neck of the woods. This is actually a picture of Chris and Charlie, one of the last photos of the two of them. Chris and Charlie had gone to explore remote parts of Sichuan province. And when they didn't return on their flight home uh, from China, a search and rescue operation was launched to find them. Now, at the time, they were both living uh, in Norwood, which, as you know, is right outside of Telluride. And so the search and rescue operation involved this incredibly complicated, coordinated effort between their friends in Telluride and the Seattle offices of Mountain Madness, as well as officials in China. So it was very complicated. It was emotional. It was frantic. And it was full of, of mystery. So there's a great mystery to their story. This is uh, Mount Genyon, which is the mountain that they had been trying to summit. And you can see sort of the lines that they um, used off there on the right. So as this process of writing the book began for me, the first place I went was research. And I poured over all of my mother's research and began reading every book that I could possibly get my hands on that fell into the category of mountaineering literature, which I'm sure most of you are very familiar with. 
And so in that sort of genre, I found that there were some books that were better than others. And I found most of those books were written by men and most of them were memoirs. And so I read book after book until they started to sound very similar. And so at that point, I began to realize that really what I wanted to read didn't exist. And what I wanted as a non-mountaineer was something that could teach me a little bit about the sport, but that also had humanity and depth. And at that point, I had access to Chris's journals. And so I had begun to learn a lot about her. I was talking to her friends and family members, and I knew I wanted to capture her spirit, but that I wanted to write much more than just a biography. I was really also very fascinated around uh, about the details around putting together expeditions, uh, the science around training for big climbs. I wanted something that could teach and inspire and motivate and captivate. And basically I wanted to read a book that, um, it, basically I wanted to write a book that I would be interested in reading as a reader. So that was a turning point for me when I realized that what I wanted to write didn't exist. And it certainly didn't exist with an American female alpinist at the center of the story. So this is another great picture of Chris. So this process, the process of writing the book quickly got big, bigger than I imagined. So as you heard, I've, I interviewed probably 75 people, read everything I could get my hands on. I traveled several times to Seattle and Telluride. And eventually I did go to China to retrace Chris and Charlie's last steps. So in this process, I was constantly falling down these rabbit holes as a writer. So much of this sport and this world I just found was so juicy and intriguing that um, I just kind of kept getting lost, which is why we read these books so voraciously. The lifestyle, the personalities were fascinating to me, the environmental impact of mountaineering. I wanted to understand the Sherpa lifestyle, so I got kind of in that rabbit hole for a while, the spirituality and the ethics of climbing sacred peaks of which Genyan is a sacred peak. That was really interesting to me. And then of course, how trauma and loss and grief affect the world of climbing. And then also obviously the role of women in this sport uh, and in leadership positions in sports that are dominated by men. So I wanted to include all of that and hopefully I did that. Uh, and I've written something hopefully that has a little bit of everything. Uh, and is a pretty compelling narrative, but is really grounded in the story of this unbelievable climber. This is a quick picture of Keith Boscoff. He was Chris's husband, and he was the one who got her hooked on the sport. They met in Atlanta when she was working for Lockheed Martin. And so you will meet uh, Keith very early in the story. I think he enters the story in chapter two or three. Then I've got a picture, a couple of pictures here of Scott Fisher. Scott Fisher and Chris met one time in 1995, which was the year before he died on Mount Everest. And I was actually able to recreate that meeting with help and that scene with help. So part of the challenge with writing Edge of the Map was that so many of the main players had died. And so I was challenged because I was adamant that I really wanted this to remain a work of nonfiction. I didn't wanna dip my toe into historical fiction. I really wanted it to be nonfiction. So in those instances where I was writing scenes where everybody had passed and there were no living people to speak with, I had to rely heavily on other sources to write um, those scenes. And we can talk a lot more about that process and what that was like after you finish the book and, and I come back to chat with you. This is another great picture of Scott Fisher a couple years before he died. And then I think we've got a couple pictures of Charlie Fowler. This is a young Charlie Fowler a picture taken by Alex Lowe. I think he was um, climbing somewhere in Rocky Mountain National Park, I believe. And then we've got an older picture of Charlie as well. You will also meet uh, Jane Courage on the left here. Jane was Chris's best friend and was really insightful as I was um, working on the book. She happily is still with us. So I spent a lot of time with Jane kind of getting to know her as well as understanding Chris quite a bit better. You will also meet Kelly Sherpa. He was Chris's uh, lead Sherpa based in uh, Kathmandu and ran the Kathmandu Nepal operations of Mountain Madness. 
And um, as I mentioned, I was able to go over to China. I also stopped brief briefly in Kathmandu and spent uh, several days with Kili, which was really wonderful. So he comes into the narrative as well. This is the Genyan Valley and the site of Chris and Charlie's last trip, which is just, oh, the whole valley is just this astonishingly beautiful valley with all of these gorgeous jagged peaks and beautiful rushing rivers. This particular monastery, Langu Monastery, sits at about 16,000 feet. So obviously it's got very few inhabitants. So I did travel there to be able to write those last few chapters of the book in a more authentic way. And it was really quite magical. Uh, and I always say more than anything, I think that particular trip and being in um, that particular wild places, you know, there's so few wild places left in the world. And that really did help me kind of put things into perspective a bit and helped me understand why uh, Chris and Charlie were driven to seek such beautiful unexplored places. This is a picture of me at the monastery with a couple of the monks. Again, this monastery sits at the base of the mountain that Chris and Charlie had climbed and where they perished. So the monks were also super useful to talk to and very valuable because some of them remembered Chris and Charlie from many years prior and their visit to the monastery before they went off to try to summit the mountain. And I was able to talk to them about the power of the mountains and what they remembered. Communication with the monks was a little different, difficult because they don't speak a whole lot of Chinese. Um, and I actually do speak a little bit of Chinese, so that would have been helpful. So we kind of pieced together the Chinese that we knew, um, but used also a translator because these particular monks spoke primarily Tibetan. So lots of pantomiming and laughing in this process. So this is actually the last um, image I've got, and I will just close by going back to the start of this journey, which Taylor told you a little bit about. Um, and mention a couple of things that I've taken away from this process. At the start of the book, um, uh, this was one, a book that my mother had started. I know that we talked about that in the beginning and she had talked a little bit about how it landed in my lap. lap. And the backstory was that both Chris and I, again, were raised in Appleton, Wisconsin. And it is a city in Northeast Wisconsin, as far away from the greater Himalaya as you can possibly imagine. Chris was three years older than me. And though we went to the same high school and lived only a couple of miles apart, we never actually met. And so she graduated and left Appleton. And then I graduated three years later and left as well. We both ended up here in Colorado. She ended up with Charlie near Telluride and I ended up uh, in Denver. And as I said, I wasn't a climber, so I wasn't in that world. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't know who she was, but the bigger and I think more compelling reason is that she was just so darn humble. She had summited more 8,000 meter peaks than any other American woman, which makes her the counterpart to Ed Vister's, whose name is well known beyond mountaineering circles. Uh, but she was just very under the radar. And again, this was 20 years ago, well before social media was a big bad thing. So even coming from the same hometown, um, this kind of smallish hometown, I didn't know who she was. So it really wasn't until 2006 when she and Charlie went missing that there was a very small article published in our hometown newspaper, the Appleton Post Crescent. And my mother saw it and asked if I knew who she was and I didn't know. And my mom was just really intrigued and began looking into her story. And once she understood the depth of Chris's accomplishments, she understood that this was really a story that needed to be told. And at that point, she reached out to Chris's mom, who again lived just a few miles away. And the two women forged this really lovely friendship that spanned many years and continues to this day. That friendship, I'm happy to say, um, was passed on to me. So now I'm also dear friends with Chris's mom, who is now 96 years old. Uh, and so that friendship was passed on to me, along with all of the boxes of research and the hope that one day Chris's story will be told. So I am very happy that I was able to finish my mother's work. And the book was published about two years ago in April 2020. And it's just, yeah, it's a great place to end. And um, I'm so excited and looking forward to having all of you read the book. I think there are lots of places to, as I say, fall down rabbit holes. 
And um, yeah, I look forward to being with you at the end of all of this. Thank you so much. We're really looking forward to it as well. I just finished the book and I gave it a five star rating on Goodreads. And I think that if you're able to get your hands on a copy, which we will have several at the library, that you will take a deep dive into this story, even if you aren't a mountaineer. I'm certainly not, just like Joanna, but there's so much that we can learn. And I especially like what you said about the power of the mountains. And as we recreate in our beautiful valley this summer, let's uh, take some of these lessons from Joanna and from Chris and uh, really go exploring together. So I hope to see you later this month and later this summer. And thank you, Joanna, for being here and giving us this presentation. Thank you. We'll see you in a few weeks.